Uh, good evening. My name is Ryan Flores. I'm the technical services manager at the Westchester Public Library. And I'd like to introduce, um, thank you for joining us for an evening with Gavin Van Horn. Uh, as executive editor of the Center for Humans and Nature Press Books, Gavin develops and directs transdisciplinary projects that seek to illuminate what it means to become human with a more, within a more than human world. He received a BA from Pepperdine University, a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary, and his doctorate from the University of Florida with a specialization in religion and nature. His dissertation research examined the religious, cultural, and ethical values involved in the reintroduction of wolves to the Southwestern United States. He also written the following books, uh, Kinship, Belonging in a World of Relations, The Way of the Coyote, Shared Journeys in the Urban Wilds, Wildness, Relations of People and Place, and City Creatures, Animal Encounters in the Chicago Wilderness. And we do have a copy of, you can see it, uh, The Way of the Coyote here at our library. So please be sure to check it out. Without further ado, uh, Gavin, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Ryan, I appreciate it. And thank you to those who are here with me, uh, even though I can't see you. Uh, <laughs> but it's nice to be here and, um, you know, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about the book that uh, Ryan mentioned. I won't sometimes be talking directly about the book, but more about the, the themes that are um, embedded within the book. So these are things like nature near at hand um, and the everyday intimacies that are possible uh, within an urban environment with the natural world. Um, something that I call um, micro rewilding, which is... Uh, when we begin to think about how we can give back to our um, urban environments. And um, another theme is really, uh, Ryan mentioned the word, because uh, we just did a, bit, a series on kinship. And I wanna talk about what kinship might look like from the backyard to the bioregion. So at different scales, what that might look like. Um, I'm going to, share my screen with you and uh, there'll be some images that will keep us on track and maybe give a little visual, some visual aids for you. So share my screen here. All right. So I hope everybody can see that. And um, if there is a problem, Ryan, just hop back in and, and interject and we can slow it down and figure it out. So urban areas are sometimes places where we find ourselves. Um, that was the case for me. Um, and sometimes we may not have planned on being there um, to begin with. I grew up in a more or less suburban area in Oklahoma, and I never expected to move to Chicago, the third biggest metropolitan area in the United States. To give you a, an idea of what my plan A looked like, um, it looked a little something like this, bucolic cabin in the woods, maybe a little bit of smoke curling out of the chimney, um, probably me chopping my own firewood and hauling my own water, something like that. You know, I had a very romantic rural uh, visions for myself. But as I said, that's, that's not what happened. The city seems to suck many of us into its gravitational orbit the density of people becoming a kind of magnet, a concentration of energy, cultures, and yes, ecologies, which is something that I was to find out much more about as I got to know the Chicago metro area. But one day we might look up and find we are city dwellers. And certainly, as I said, that's what happened to me. So we may find ourselves in the city physically, but I think there's another way that we might find ourselves in the city um, where we might come to discover who we are by getting to know who is around us. And I don't just mean humans, I mean our non-human neighbors, which you'll hear me um, talk quite a bit about tonight. Um, and that's what The Way of Coyote, the book that I wrote uh, is about. It's about my experiences, um, getting to know those non-human neighbors and getting to know really the biological richness uh, and the uh, diversity of a city, which in my mind before had been a kind of blank spot on 
the map, my mental map. It had kind of been an area that I didn't think of or didn't associate directly with natural wonder. And I was to find out that I was incredibly wrong about that. So tonight I will talk about a couple of things uh, with you. One, I'm going to talk about how nature doesn't stop at the city limit signs. Um, the second thing I'll talk about is because most people now live in cities, urban areas are potentially our greatest places for intimacy with uh, wildlife, with nature, simply because we're there most of the time. And that means that we don't, I would, you know, one of the things you'll hear me probably repeat is that we don't have to drive to these monumental national parks or wilderness areas to experience the awe, the wonder, and the depth of emotional connection and relational connection with a natural world. Um, we can do that right uh, outside our doors. Um, so the relationships, um, our relationships are not built on one-time postcard experiences they hap happen um, by daily practice um, the third thing i'll talk about is how cities in order to be life generating must move toward alignment within within the larger landscapes that they're a part of so we'll talk about um, moving from what i'm calling passive kinship to active kinship and then the fourth uh, last but not least thing is I'm going to bring Coyote into the mix. Coyote as, as trickster archetype, as trickster figure, because he might have some suggestions to offer in terms of, of kinship. But let's begin with nature's boundary crossing tendencies. So cities are full of humans, of course, um, but they also have diverse stories, languages, and cultures that are non-human. There are places of these other species, movements, languages, and ways of being. And these creatures carry their own stories of migration and dwelling. A simple way to say this is the city is habitat. It is alive. And one idea I'd like you to hold on to today is that our animal kin can help us rethink what our responsibilities to nature are by reframing where we think nature is or should be or can be. So looking to other animals to imagine what a city can be has greater urgency nowadays, I would say. It's a time when we're witnessing the impact of cognitively, culturally, and morally separating ourselves from the living landscape. The Way of Coyote is my own orientation to urban life. And the title carries the, na the coyote's name because in the United States, coyotes have come to the city and done such an incredible job of muddying the boundaries between the urban and the wild that we might hold in our heads. I've had many coyotes encou encounters in Chicago. This is just one of them. Uh, what you're seeing here is sometimes called the mutual gaze, uh, where I am regard I am watching this coyote, but of course you can say you can tell that the coyote is regarding me right back. And there can be something kind of especially penetrating about that where we recognize the subjectivity of another species, that this, this animal has plans of its own, thoughts of its own, a world of its own, and that we are a part of that uh, world um, just as much as, as the coyote is a part of mine. And now that I live in California, I was just telling Ryan that we moved here a little over uh, a year ago, I still see uh, coyotes. In fact, this is sort of one of, the, one of their uh, primary stomping grounds, if, if you will. Um, and it's kind of a home base for them. And I check in with them here as well. Uh, or maybe they check in with me. I haven't figured that out yet. But as far as Chicago goes, um, there are probably, it's, it's hard to know, there are no like hard and fast numbers, but estimates uh, say that there's probably around 4,000 coyotes in the Chicago metropolitan area. And so, when I moved to Chicago, they became a sort of city guide for me because they're such good urban adapters. So I was an urban transplant, transplant, like many people are. And once my perceptual lenses adjusted, I found that there is a whole lot to discover in an urban area like Chicago. So 
But like Coyote, I adapted to my environment. One, ma one main takeaway about coyotes is that they let us know that the mental boundaries we keep between the human and the wild are more mushed together than we might have ever previously imagined. Our fate is held in common with many other creatures and coyotes are one of the more visible and charismatic examples of this. A good deal of my work at the Center for Humans and Nature focuses on how we can respond to and become more responsible for the well being of our places, wherever we happen to live. So, in this sense, coyotes are only a starting point. They're a portal into a much larger question about how many other animals navigate the city alongside us and how we might adapt to intentionally include them in those environments to celebrate our other than human kin in urban areas. We're living during a time when some of the former pressures that once drove animals away from the city are relaxing. Many cities are becoming what is called post-industrial and the search is on to attract people with natural amenities like healthy lifestyle options, uh, green space, parks, urban forests, and so on. So these things are good for adaptive animals as well who are finding their ways among us. And of course, our health is linked to theirs in many, many ways. There are also many um, uh, caring persons who are working to actively restore and heal natural areas within, uh, within the urban context, trying to encourage this kind of coexistence. These are people who have come to that realization that that a city can be full of natural wonders, and that we can actually participate in um, in that larger uh, land healing process. So, rather than treat nature as out there, um, I'd like to introduce you to something that we can call the wild continuum. We might put a line on a map to mark the boundary of a municipal area. When we think about it, where does a city actually end? It's a constant exchange of people, of energy, transportation, food and waste products, even policy and legislation crosses lines, and yes, always other animals. And if you take anything away with you from tonight, I'd like those binaries that you might hold at present between urban and rural, between city and wild, between natural and unnatural to erode to become more porous. The city is embedded in the country and the country is within the city in terms of those things that I mentioned, the exchange of energy, transportation, food, waste products. Rural Illinois, even rural Kansas or rural China is embedded in Chicago. And in turn, Chicago reaches into those places. This is not to say that cities are perfectly fine as they are. So the question then becomes, for me at least, how do we go between those lines and under the pavement to find a deeper story that we're a part of, to gain some perspective? Cities tell a story through their physical design. And then we need to ask, what story do we want to tell? <laughs> what invitation do we want to offer those uh, who are in physical and emotional conversation with urban places? And who are we telling this story for? Whether it's an urban neighborhood plan, a building facade, a suspension bridge, a wildlife overpass, or even a, something as simple as a park bench. What kinds of conversations are those inviting? What kinds of stories are those, those telling about the human place within this world? A couple of um, images here on, on your screen, just you might recognize, or you might have even been there before. The bigger image in the background is the uh, CalSAG Channel Trail. And it's a good example of where there's an underpass. There's been a way built, not just for bicyclists, but also for other animals to um, not have to cross such a busy uh, urban street. The picture on your left uh, in the corner there is uh, a segment of the 606 trail, which is a, uh, an elevated rail line that was abandoned and has now been converted in, in <clears throat> the near North part of Chicago to a running and biking trail, but also incredible plantings, um, you know, uh, along uh, that trail that provide habitat for other species. 
um, especially probably pollinators and birds who uh, come there on mass to feed. And then the 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 last uh, picture in the right hand corner, lower right hand corner, is not from Chicago. It's from a Dutch um, uh, city where the bus stop has uh, the top of the bus stop is is a sort of urban garden. Um, so it shows that you can put green wherever there is a surface almost. Um, and I'm sure you all are familiar with some of the rooftop uh, gardens that are in the Chicago area, which are another example of that. All this to say is that humans are one part of a community's story and a small one that, at that, if even if we have an outsized footprint and abilities to manipulate landscapes at scale. So the first step I think is to realize, that, just to realize that we live in multi-species communities. We aren't the only species in town. Uh, in Chicago, just to name a few of our neighbors, there's black crowned night herons, peregrine falcons, garter snakes, red admiral butterflies, beavers, eastern gray squirrels, cooper's hawks, bumblebees, hawk moths, chimney swifts, meadow voles, spring peepers, coyotes, possums, night jars, striped skunks, herring gulls, raccoons, white-tailed deer, little brown bats, and so many other creatures with other than human intelligences that move among us, that dwell in our midst, and that thread their lives through our own. Here's what I'd like to suggest for, for urban areas as a goal, as a kind of North Star to be guided by. Urban areas should be designed as cities for life. They should be life affirming. Um, so how can we engage in our ur urban places in a way that life can flourish, that the world becomes more biologically diverse, not less? The story that we tell through the things we build ideally will invite human empathy for the lives of other species. In other words, moving towards cities for life will impact not only physical infrastructure, but the infrastructure of the imagination. De not designing cities for life with some of those examples that I showed you on the last slide, just being among the many that we could use as examples, tell a story that humans can be good conversation partners with non-humans, that we can reflect upon their needs, anticipate their needs, that's empathy, and design and act in such a way as to accommodate them, appreciate them, and to the degree, to the degree possible, align our lives with theirs. So let's look at a couple of examples of, of what I'm getting at. First up, I, I wanna take you to, uh, or I wanna talk about this as passive kinship. This, hold that in mind while we think through this example. So I wanna take you to downtown Chicago, specifically to the office building I used to work in at the Center for Humans and Nature. We we're lucky enough to have a small office in the Civic Opera Building which is a, a landmark that many of you will be familiar with. Um, it's an architecturally intriguing piece of 1920s you know, art deco design located on the banks, um, if there were still banks, of the South Branch of the Chicago River. But I don't wanna talk about the architecture so much as I wanna talk about the wild ways that other animals have adapted to what the city offers. And to do that, I'd like to mention colleague of mine named Anya Klaus, <clears throat> who frequently in the middle of a quiet work day would begin pointing out our office window and yelling, oh, oh, oh. So <laughs> what was Anya pointing at? I mean, as you can tell from the slide, Falco peregrinus, peregrine falcon, commonly known, uh, you know, commonly known as the peregrine falcon. A couple of things that are really cool about peregrines. They're aerial hunters. They strike at birds from above in what's called a stoop. And here's a nice image of that. And these dive bombing free falls, they've been clocked at speeds of over 200 miles per hour. Fastest speeds, in fact, of any animal on the planet. And why are they in downtown Chicago, circling above Millennium Park and Wacker Drive, causing me and my office mates to run to the window to see them picking apart a, a pigeon on the edge of a building habitat, other things too, but we'll start with habitat. Skyscrapers like the one in downtown, the ones in downtown Chicago with grids of road between them can be seen as an imposition on the landscape. In many ways they are. 
But these buildings and roads also inadvertently created something peregrines recognize, canyon lands, steep walled elevated places to build nests and hunt an abundance of urban prey. As a keen eyed aerodynamic aerial carnivore, peregrines say, thank you very much. And this picture, by the way, is one of the um, monitors of peregrine nests. She's uh, out on a ledge uh, where one of their nests are in downtown Chicago. Um, and you can see barely and blurry right um, to the right of her and just a little bit down a very angry peregrine uh, parent who doesn't appreciate their nest being monitored. So let's call this type of kinship of urban infrastructure, passive kinship, because really the peregrines are just taking advantage of what we've built. Um, I used to live in uh, Evanston, Illinois, uh, just north of Chicago. And there are a peregrine uh, pair there, uh, Nona and Squawker are their names, and they've made a nest at the public library for many consecutive years. Uh, they're a little closer to the ground than most peregrines. They're only uh, three stories up and you can literally walk up three flights of stairs and go to the window and take a peek at what they're up to uh, while they're nesting. And usually it's these little guys that they're fussing over. Visiting the Evanston Public Library is a good reminder to me that urban ecology isn't an empty concept. It means that there are wild beings in our midst, making use of what we've built, hunting, raising families, playing, communicating, living, many of them thriving, enlivening our cities. So sometimes accidental, accidentally or passively, we create in other animals benefit, passive kinship, or simply, ooh, 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 as my colleague Anya put it. What if we were to increase our engagement? to go from passive um, activity to active attention and care. That would take us into what we might call active kinship. Um, to, it, to distinguish it from a kind of passive shoulder shrug acknowledgement that the city is habitat. In the United States, I think a good mnemonic for active kinship would be the monarch butterfly. Monarchs have become poster children for pollinator habitat because of their incredible migratory journeys that sometimes cover thousands of miles. At present, there's an incredible um, team of folks led by Abigail Derby Lewis at Chicago's Field Museum who are looking at all the ways the city can offer potential habitat for monarchs. Now understand this isn't solely about monarchs. They're just the charismatic umbrella species for thousands of other insects who would benefit from having plants to feed on, plants to lay their eggs on, and to hunt and generally bring a buzzing, healthier, wilder city into being. But the monarchs have caused Abigail and her team to look at cities with a new lens. In a sea of monocultural uh, agricultural lands, monoculture agricultural lands, which is what most of the state of Illinois uh, is, in, at least in rural areas, um, Pesticides are often used liberally and without consideration for the impacts of other species or any other species, but the species that is trying to be grown, which is usually corn or soy. So these social and ecological scientists at the Field Museum are looking to cities as providing life-giving potential for habitat, for refuge, really. Abigail told me, I would argue that the social aspect of this is the most important part of the work and also all conservation work. The first phase of her team's efforts was to do an analysis of four large cities along the Monarch's migratory flyway. And that included St. Paul, Minneapolis, Chicago, Kansas City, and Austin. And the results and products of these things were things ranging from bilingual storybooks featuring Monarchs to spatial planning tools for city uh, planners. And those were released a few years ago. And then the team entered a phase two, which is to look at mid-sized cities. So they're taking, they're taking it at scale to different levels and eventually, you know, to vacant lots, schoolyards, cemeteries, golf courses, and residential areas. This is a 
shift I want to encourage in your mind if you think of cities uh, as less than. Uh, I remember when it clicked for me and talking about thinking about monarch and pollinator habitat was when I stopped looking at what's usually thought of as weedy, undeveloped land. And that land became an exciting opportunity for habitat, for generating wildlife potential. And the moment where it really did um, click for me was when I was walking with a woman, her name is Lisa Hish. And Lisa told me what she and her neighbors had been working on. Um, so the Parkway Corner Initiative, it started with Lisa and her partner um, wanting to have beehives in their backyard. So when they wanted to have beehives in their backyard to create honey, they had to think like a pollinator. They had to think like a bee. And that meant that their next step was mapping all the different sources of nourishment um, of nectar uh, that were within the neighborhood to find out where their bees would go, how would, and you know, and where they would, uh, how far they would have to go, and that effort and talking to neighbors got other neighbors interested in what they were doing, and it eventually led to this program where the different groups of neighbors would adopt a street corner that was otherwise just you know gravel or you know uh, just a weedy you know neglected space and started planting native species that would attract not only bees, but butterflies, um, dragonflies, birds, even bats. Um, people put up bat boxes. And here's a couple of, of those corners. And then that idea scaled into this idea of having a pollinator pathway, like a linear corridor along the road that they, the street, the urban street that they live on in Chicago. And so these parkway corners became uh, ubiquitous as people adopted and cared for these places. And that led to conversations about, you know, other animals in the neighborhood. And, and so when I asked Lisa about the way these places, these, these corners and this pollinator pathway affected her view of the city, she told me this. I used to think of cities and urban areas as granting us proximity to live and work with easy access to each other and grant access to the commons. But I was defining the commons as services, libraries, public transport, parks, blocks of businesses. But she went on to say, now I see cities as habitat, a place for us to keep or to keep us living efficiently as a species, but also places where we still need to be in relationship with other species for our health, our understanding of our place in the world. And that's the aha moment I had with Lisa. I looked around at these nondescript medians and street corners and suddenly saw them as a wild background that with human care made things possible. I consider this a variation of Aldo Leopold's call to think like a mountain, but instead it would be think like a bee. And with all the overwhelming problems facing us in the 21st century, this is one place where I find a lot of hope and meaning. Trying to take on complicated global problems, environmental problems is daunting. It can even be psychologically paralyzing. But what about your backyard? What about your balcony, your neighborhood street corners? If you think small, you'll end up thinking big. You care for the small wonders and you'll end up caring for what the city looks like and how it fits within the bioregion. You think about milkweed, and you'll end up thinking about a 2000 mile migration to central Mexico performed annually by multiple generations of a creature that weighs as much of a dusting of sugar that you might drop in your morning coffee. I've called these types of actions micro rewilding. They aren't national parks or grand legislative action to protect open space, which are important in their own right. But these intimate within walking distance Backyard acts of care for other than human kin are what braids our lives together with theirs. Another word for these micro rewildings might just be neighborliness. The value of micro rewilding is that the little acts add up. They implicate us, they involve us, they help us to internalize what we are, relationally connected and responsible for human and non-human neighbors alike. Thinking of like a bee, allows us to wonder, to see the city with new eyes, to open our minds, our eyes, our ears, and discover that a wild world is waiting. 
Sharon Blackie in her book, The Enchanted Life said, human mythologies and cosmologies have always emerged from the landscape. They don't just come out of our heads. They're a product of our immersion in the world, of our interaction with our places. In a sense, they're acts of co-creation between humans and the land. They're acts of co-creation between humans and the land. Something I've realized is that a huge strand of my own work and practice, one might say its underlying root system, is digging for a mythology of place where I am, searching underneath the concrete and between the cracks for a pulse that still beats, for a song that still quavers on the air. Other animals can help us rethink and restory our urban areas. What do they need? How can we transform our local habitats to become more welcoming for them? Think like a bee. That the city is a lifeless world, subject only to human dominance and whim, is a story. The idea that nature is somehow separate from where we live and not to be found in urban areas is a story. An alternative life-nurturing story is that wildness can be found anywhere. From all those little squiggly helpers in what's called the microbiome of your gut uh, that affects your brain health, to tree roots pushing up through the concrete, or poppies in this case, uh, on your screen, or peregrine falcon nests on the tops of skyscrapers in downtown Chicago. If we align our lifestyle with the needs of other creatures, cities can be even wilder, and so can we. So I can't speak to you today without bringing Coyote into the mix. And as I said, why does, why does he deserve to be here? Well, adaptation. And I think that's a key word for us uh, nowadays. I'd like to um, give you a little bit of background on Coyote for those who might be uh, less familiar with, uh, with coyotes and their historical trajectory. So in, in myth and legend, Coyote is a venerated person, particularly among native peoples of the American West, from the Salish to Was in Washington State to the Navajo in Arizona. In uh, the book, Coyote America, Dan Flores writes that the coyote is the most ancient deity of which we have record on this continent. And stories about coyote, as it, or old man coyote, as he's sometimes known in these oral narratives, are likewise among the oldest in North America. This is Flores again. He says, no other native deity in, in America came anywhere close to inspiring such a vast body of oral literature. West of the Mississippi, across the last 10,000 years, Coyote has been America's universal deity, surviving as a Paleolithic god among agricultural peoples like the Wichitas, and ultimately reaching as far south as the Aztecs, who knew him as Weiwei Coyotl, Old Man Coyote, or Old Man America. The reclamation of city habitat by wildlife is a national and a global trend, and coyotes have been particularly adept at this. A number of reasons account for that. The prey availability in urban areas, human pressures on non-urban habitats, laws against hunting and trapping in metropolitan areas. But in addition to these factors, coyotes are well suited for the task of urban living. Their quintessential adapters constantly define human expectations. They've escaped these Southwestern myths and go about their business largely undetected in cities far from their familiar haunts in Taos or Tucson. Vancouver, Portland, San Francisco, Denver, New York City, all now have thriving coyote research programs. And this, despite the fact that organized, organized and well-funded eradication efforts continue, coyotes have overcome again and again, spreading across the country into the niches left vacated by gray wolves, their less fortunate canine cousins. Tricksters, coyotes, real life descendants now populate every city in the United States. It's almost as if they will keep coming back uh, and, say, and seem to be saying, this land is not exclusively yours and will keep returning to jog your memories until you get it. So cities have the appearance of permanence, like the pavements we zip our cars over. But Coyote as a trickster figure reveals that there's something underneath, some wildness that intrudes between the cracks fights for a space to be. And here it might be my optimism speaking, but we'll eventually overcome our best laid concrete plans or grid-like planning. Into the city full of our own schemes to cover the earth, Coyote as trickster intrudes. I would say he simply reveals the world as it is 
ever-changing, full of chance and play and disorder and instability, and therefore creativity, serendipity, happenstance, happy accidents for the prepared mind. So Coyote came to the city. Bigger cousins or anim animals with more specialized need, needs couldn't follow. He came to shake things up, to gamble on prospering alongside the two leggeds. And he may not have come with this purpose in mind, but the presence of coyotes in cities like Chicago tells us that given the chance, many, many other animals can thrive alongside us. Cities are just a particular and maybe a little peculiar kind of habitat. Coyote shakes up those categories of nature and culture, urban and wild. And he's still going along. According to a recent National Geographic article, coyotes are on their way to South America. So how might we bring the world of other beings into our consciousness, into our practice, into our everyday world and landscape? Um, I think coyote is here again in our midst in a way to say, give up your will uh, to mastery, learn to adapt. Trickster points to the path of becoming with. And this is long-term work, of course, the fixes aren't easy and our ears need to be attuned to the music of the land. But I would suggest the best way to fix, the, fix our hearts and to open our ears to this music is through a reweaving of these kinship relationships from the balcony to the backyard to the bioregion. Other animals can help us think about what kinship might mean. The first thing is the world is not passive scenery. Trees are not furniture. We're told as, a, as children, that's a river, that's a block of wood, that's a bird. The world has a bunch of things in it presumably awaiting human use. But the, this worldview and the unconscious, the unconscious cultural assumptions behind it, as Thomas Berry once said, purports that the world is a collection of objects. In contrast to that, the idea that the world is just a, simply a collection of objects for human use, he proposes that the world is actually a communion of subjects, that the world is alive. So, when we view the world through that language of kinship, we recognize at least two things, that we are not alone and that we have responsibilities to these kin. It's harder to turn away from a person we call a relative, um, from a being who isn't an it, but is part of a communion of subjects. It's helpful for me to, to, to visualize this. Um, a collection of objects might be a group of marbles, you know, on, on the sidewalk, various colored and shaped things. But what about a communion of subjects? You might think of, of yarn, all these different varieties, tangled, curvy lines. And there are points and nodes where that yarn is more dense, uh, where there are places of thicker relation, if you will. But every creature, every being is a trace a trail in, entangled with others. The invisible tends to become visible when it snows, especially in Chicago. Uh, and, and I think it alerts us to these different intersecting stories, it shows the, the webs of trails that are all around us. There's a couple of places um, in my book uh, that I, I can't, I won't be able to touch on today, but I talk about the greenways of the city, the, the, the forest preserves and the lakeshore uh, you know, edges and the ways that there are these uh, parks and urban cemeteries and other types of green spaces, pollinator pathways that I just mentioned that, that create this lattice work of green. Uh, but there are also, there are also blue ways. Um, here is a picture of me in an inflatable kayak that I, um, purchased and then used to for easy access to the Chicago River and um, took a lot of trips under that that urban canopy where as I was mentioning to Ryan before we uh, started tonight you can be a hundred feet from an eight lane freeway and yet it's a completely other space a completely different word world a concentrated area of life because the water brings all those different species, including even mink now, beaver, 
all the the great blue herons that are so ubiquitous along this corridor, the Chicago River and the Des Plaines River in your area, Westchester. Um, they're amazing blue ways. So you've got your green ways, you've got your blue ways. And then I discuss what I call mind ways, the corridors of our mind, the ways that our perception can be opened up to this wildness within our midst. So the world is reaching out uh, in many different ways, this communion of subjects. And this is a picture of me kayaking in downtown Chicago, actually kayaked all the way from Evanston to Chicago uh, in a little bit of a crazy moment. Um, this is another example of the uh, greenways that are all around us. Um, one of the, the ways that uh, we can, I think, understand our kinship with the land in a bodily way is, is walking, um, intertwining our trails repeatedly with the trails of other creatures. And sometimes it's nice to take our shoes off to experience the, the land that we're walking on. Uh, there's a, this could be, you can think of this as listening from the ground up though, prioritizing heels overhead instead of head over heels. Um, and I'm not saying this is for everyone, especially those who might live near the Arctic circle, but even relatively cold climates, there are still possibilities. Uh, I, for example, was inspired by the late Scottish mountaineer Nan Shepherd in her book, The Living Mountain which builds to a, a pretty amazing conclusion, but I'd like to read you a quote from that book. Walking thus hour after hour, the senses keyed, one walks the flesh transparent, but no metaphor, transparent or light as air is adequate. The body is made negligible, but paramount. Flesh is not annihilated, but fulfilled. One is not bodiless, but essential body. It is therefore when the body is keyed to its highest potential and controlled to a profound harmony, deepening into something that resembles trance, that I discover most nearly what it is to be. I have walked out of the body and into the mountain. I am a manifestation of its total life, as is the starry saxifrage or the white winged ptarmigan. Walking can um, connect us so deeply that. You can walk the flesh transparent, according to Nan Shepherd. So while I lived in the Chicago land area, I thought, well, if Nan can do it in Scottish, cold Scottish mountains where the winds are, you know, 50 or 60 miles per hour, surely I can give it a shot here in the, my local woods. And here's a sampling of a few things that I learned by taking my shoes off that day. When you're taking your feet out of cold water, the air nearly feels warm. Fall leaves are a wonderful cushion for walking. When you're walking barefoot, you have to slow down considerably to walk, which brings to mind, or which brings many things into view at ground level that would otherwise be missed. Green moss, still bright and green in this winter wood and a delightful feeling between the toes. Where the sun shone on the trail, the soil was noticeably warm and awake. And finally, a trail is different every time you walk it, not just because there are different emotions or openness you bring to it on any given day, but based on how you walk it. Being barefoot helps absorb its textures, your skins to the earth skin, feeling out the details of touch, heels overhead. This is what sometimes is called a slow walk, allowing our foot, footfall to fall in rhythm with the earth's rhythms not at all worrying about getting from point A to point B in a minimum amount of time. It's kind of the anti, uh, you know, city stance, you know, where you're always rushing, rush hour. This is rather an intentional slowing down, a meandering, a wild walking, being open to where you might not have expected to go. So as I said, I write about some of this kind of walking in, in the Greenways chapter of The Way of Coyote. But some tips to heighten the experience, I think. Walk at least at half your normal speed, if not slower. The only goal is to be present. And notice what you notice. What draws your attention? Follow that instinct. Linger. 
And remember that this type of walking is a conversation. We allow others to be, and we especially try to listen, try to open our full capacity for listening, not just with our ears, but with our feet, with our eyes, with our whole body. And even though you're walking slowly, you may wanna pause every once in a while to give that moment just a little bit of extra attention to see what happens. This is, um, I found that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's, uh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monks uh, advice is helpful in this res respect. He advises pausing every few minutes and saying out loud, I have arrived, I am home. To me, that's what kinship is all about. Uh, I have arrived, I am home. Our stories become intertwined with the stories and the tracks and the traces and the trails and the underground burrows and the flyways of other creatures. And through that intertwining, fresh stories are created. I would like to close with a little something that I wrote that has some relevance here, taking us back and uh, letting Coyote maybe have the last word. Um, it's a story about what will outlive us, a story about what's there, even when we think it may have vanished. It's a story about Coyote the trickster come to remind us about what we might have forgotten. It goes a little something like this. Black nose glistening an inch off the pavement. The snows have pulled back. A warmer earth is on the way. Rain drizzles down my golden snout, opens up ripe aromas. Fresh baked pastries, blossoms in the median, diesel exhaust. A slickened rainbow, promises unkept of puddled motor oil. You tried your best. Money, bureaucracy, and chemistry form the sticky clay around a geode of bloodlust. New nation hard at work to cleanse the howling wilderness. First traps and rifles, then bounties, strychnine lace base, baits, mass produced government poisons, thallium sulfate, sodium fluoric acetate, M44 cyanide tubes, so called humane coyote getter. You hung our bodies from fences and cars, tossed our skins and rigid limbs out with the garbage. A lot of people don't know. It's still happening. Yet, I'm a born dancer. I jigged into your cities, even when you sleep, especially when you sleep. I know traffic patterns, how to disappear, how to dine at cemeteries. What made me despisable, so disposable? What made you call out varmint with spittle on your lips, name me unworthy of anything but a bullet or poison? It wasn't always this way with two-legged, you know. People liked me, really liked me. I mean, sure, I screwed up the way the stars got hung in the sky, but I had a hand in creating this land too. Plus, I'm a born comedian. I got my head stuck in a buffalo skull and couldn't find my own asshole once. What I'm really good at is thinking outside the box. You might want to pay attention. U.S. Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services Annual Statistics 2018 likely underreported. Murdered 375 cougars, 357 wolves, 361 black bears, 1,014 bobcats, 1,948 gray foxes, 1,705 red foxes, 22,656 beavers, and 68,292 coyotes. I win again. All paid for by your taxes. In your mind, I've always carried more than fur or fang, more than merely a threat to sheep and peaceable kingdoms. You militarized biocide because you knew deep in your bones, I carry a cosmology, one that keeps you up at night. I'm trickster, transformation, change, adaptation. I'll circle behind you, my lip curled in what passes for a smile. Border walls, glass ceilings, red lines, either or, white and. The world becomes hypoxic without circulation. Control, a product of fear, opposes trickster play. Control, keeping people in their place. Industrializing agriculture, hoarding fossil fuels, clinging to private property, lusting for political power, leads to cataclysm. 
this is not my way. Why succumb to a failure of imagination? You hear me chorusing, yips atop discarded, junked out cars. Your wildly thumping heart knows how to answer. I require only this, give up the pretense that the land is yours. Oh, and a bit of parting advice. Learn the old ways, move with your nose close to the land, dig beneath the pavement, keep faith with life, arch that spine of yours every once in a while and call to the moon. I'll be nearby, always. This is a shared journey of kinship that includes us all. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share now so we can take a few questions if there are some and bathe in the silence that is the Zoom. Well, thank you for that, Gavin. It was very informative and interesting. Um, again, if you've got any questions, go ahead and um, type them. I'm going to check on the live stream. I, I did want to say um, that if, if for um, people watching and to kind of um, prove what you were kind of talking about, uh, earlier this summer, we planted two pollinator gardens. Um, one was uh, through a grant and one was through some donations we received. And um, the library? Yes. And uh, I, prior to this summer, I don't think I had ever seen a hummingbird in the wild. <laughs> and I see them every day now, and they're becoming really commonplace to me. Like wow, ruby-throated, right? Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, there's, I, I see them like kind of dogfighting with each other. Oh, yeah, um, they're fierce. Yeah, and just for everyone watching, if you haven't had a chance uh, to stop at our pollinator garden yet, or any of them, please, you know, come by the library to do so. Um, but I had one question, um, like you had mentioned the kind of uh, idea of responsibilities to kin. Uh -huh. And um, I just was wondering, are you familiar with the coyote at the Cook County Forest Preserve that, um, maybe getting the story wrong, but uh, he, was found um, and I mistakenly um, identified as a dog. Uh, hmm. The pound identified him as a coyote and he was living in some area now in a cage uh, in a northern, um, one of the northern preserves. And there's now um, a big debate on it whether he should go to a, um, a coyote sanctuary in Colorado or if he should stay here because he's not used to living with other coyotes. And it's been kind of a big thing here. And uh, the comedian Ricky Gervais earlier this month, they had, you know, decided to weigh in on it. So I guess really, no, I yeah, missed the, that. Question, um, the question, I guess, is, you know, how, like, what would you like say for something like that, where we are helping out fellow kin, but we can't seem to agree on the best way to help. Yeah, I mean, that's, it can get really complicated, right? I mean, another sort of parallel example uh, of something like that with a non-canine is like when beavers are fine in the, uh, you know, more or less in the, in the Chicago River, but there are some beavers that took up residence in North Pond, which is by the um, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And as beavers will do, they... Um, you know, began to gnaw down some of the older cottonwood and willow trees that were, you know, the only trees there that provided shade and habitat for a number of other animals. Now, usually beavers are very positive, what they're called ecosystem engineers on their environments, but in an urban area where they have nowhere else to go, you know, they've still got to have that supply of, of wood. So there was a lot of debate about whether or not they should be captured and translocated to a place where they might be better off or, you know, once you translocate an animal, um, as you kind of alluded to with what you're saying about coyotes, they're in a, a new environment to them with different social arrangements. And it can often be 
impossible to navigate that new environment in a, in a way that it's not just drop them off and leave them and, you know, and, and hope they do well. So yeah, it does create a lot of complicated things, um, you know, but I, I hope that, the, you know, the, the conversations that come out of that, you know, do express ultimately that you have the care and well-being of the, of the other, you know, animal in mind and that you recognize that the animal is not only an individual, but part of a social arrangement oftentimes, depending on the species. So yeah, with coyotes, it's, it's a tricky thing, you know, um, because they do are pack animals. Yeah, and I, um, I know too, there's, uh, at least over the summer around here, um, um, Westchester, LaGrange Park, and um, part of Brookfield, um, there's a forest preserve in between them. And there was a coyote with mange, um, mm. kind of traveling through, you know, the town. Right. Um, and I know they finally caught it uh, and sent it to um, a wildlife rehabilitation center in Kane yeah. County. But, you know, that was another thing where people were like, well, just let nature take its course. Mm. And other people were, you know, like, no, we can help it. Right, right. Like when to, when or if to intervene is, it can always be a, yeah, a tricky, complicated thing. We had one uh, on YouTube. Um, what kind of animals did you see when you would kayak down the Chicago River? Yeah, so, um, well, there's, first of all, there's all the different kinds of herons, right? You've got the black crown night heron, the green heron, and the big great blue herons, um, which, you know, when you startle them can really startle you because the big croaking sounds they make as they flap away. Um, but, um, so, but so abundant bird life of all kinds, right? But also reptiles, you have turtles, you know, lined up on logs, you have snakes, you have, as I mentioned, mink uh, have started to come back to some places of the Chicago River, which is kind of just, uh, just amazing to see, you know, um, I watched a, a mink uh, dismantle a crawfish, you know, on the shore. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the big crunching with the teeth is, you know, pointed teeth, uh, you know, really make a meal of this thing. And then, as I mentioned, beavers and then all kinds of fish, you know, the the cool thing about the Chicago River, it's a real comeback story in a way. I mean, in the 70s, uh, it was said that no friends, the Chicago River had no friends. I mean, it was an industrial uh, dumping ground, the sewage, you know, a wastewater, you know, essentially uh, shoot to uh, get waste out of the city. Um, but then people began to care for it, including a, a group in Chicago that intentionally named itself for Friends of the Chicago River, um, you know, to counter that narrative of the Chicago River having no friends. And so a lot of um, restoration has been done. Sewage treatment has grow, you know, gotten better leaps and bounds, the technologies for it. So that the water, they say, will be safe enough to swim in if it's not already, um, uh, you know, throughout the Chicago River. Um, and so that's a real, you know, after, you know, having been so abused for so long um, to see, I, I was reminded of this because the fish species, there used to be only a handful of fish species that had survived. And now there's you know, dozens and dozens of fish species in the Chicago River. So it's improving. Hopefully it'll become, you know, uh, clean enough to where people can not just kayak on it, but swim in it, you know, um, then you've really, uh, I think you've passed a milestone when you've reached that point where your river is no longer something to run away from, but something to run toward. <laughs> um, someone had asked, uh, which landscape do you like better, California or Illinois? <laughs> it's like uh somebody uh asking you know when you're uh like uh it's like saying the wrong name at a concert like you know being in uh you know bulls the bulls arena and being like <laughs> hello wisconsin you know you can't you can't make me do that i will say that i um i think there are things to appreciate about uh any landscape where you find yourself in and that's really what that the book was was about was being a good guest on a landscape that I knew that I probably wouldn't be there for a lifetime. Um, but wanting to be the best house guest, you know, I could be, uh, and really respect and, and learn, 
uh, what was there. So there's some things I miss about it, especially fall is my favorite time of year that's coming up. And, you know, I, I definitely miss the changing of the leaves, the migration of the birds and, and, uh, and uh, that first nip of, uh, of winter on its way. Um, but yeah, you know, it's hard to beat having both the mountains and the beach uh, and the ocean right by. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> Well, I think that was all of them that came through Facebook. So, yeah, thank you again for this um, informative presentation. And again, we do have uh, the Way of the Coyote available for checkout at the library. So please check it out. There you go. Great book. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. You have a good rest of the evening. Thanks again, Gavin. All right. Take care, folks. Bye.